Mm. All right. So <clears throat> I thought I would give like a introduction to deep generative learning. Um, it's a specific class of inverse design. So there are other ways to do inverse design that are not generative learning. Um, but I think for this project, especially, we're going to focus on generative learning. And I think it's a really exciting um, topic anyway. So it's, it's a little more accessible, a little more fun than like some of the um, more nitty gritty like numerical approaches to inverse design. Um, so the general motivation of why material scientists should care about generative design or inverse design uh, in a broader sense is basically the idea that uh, function arises from structure. I mean, everyone here knows about, you know, structure property relationships and um, uh, processing structure property performance relationships, however you like to say it. Um, but basically structure in some sense of either um, you know, symmetry, geometry, topology, chemistry, whatever you're thinking about for structure um, leads to certain functionalities depending on the physics that you care about. So it might be electromagnetic or mechanical or thermodynamic response. Um, and the idea is, you know, we, we come up with materials, either we find them or we, you know, make them ourselves based on intuition or prior experience. Um, and we can do either simulations or experiments, whatever you like, but we can basically evaluate the response of those materials. So for electromagnetism, for instance, we can take a colloidal crystal and we can simulate uh, the scattering of electromagnetic waves through that crystal. And <clears throat> we might get a photonic band gap. So this is how the uh, structure in, in real space, but also somehow related to like the symmetries um, leads to a electromagnetic response. And we have a lot of different ways of doing this for different types of uh, material responses. Uh, so for mechanics, for instance, we use finite element simulations or just like compressive testing or tensile testing. Um, and we can evaluate things like a modulus or a Poisson's ratio, and we can get all sorts of cool properties uh, like these auxetic materials with negative Poisson's ratio. Um, likewise, with thermodynamics, um, you know, we can postulate some structure or uh, we can find some structure that we know does something interesting and simulate it um, with uh, all sorts of methods, but one way would be Monte Carlo simulation. And we could evaluate things like um, propensity for hydrogen storage. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different ways of doing this, taking a structure, putting it into a physical based model, and then obtaining a response, right? This, this forward direction is straightforward and very well studied. Um, but the problem is that function is not invertible to structure. So, you know, when we do this direct or forward uh, mode, we postulate a structure or we find a structure and we evaluate it. It's like the function F, it, it takes some structure X and it gives us some response Y. Um, the question is like, how do you take Y and go back to X? I mean, you, you can't just write down like a mathematical uh, inversion of a property and get a structure. Typically, the structure is much higher dimensional, for instance, that's one problem. So uh, maybe, our, maybe our mechanical property is a modulus. So it might be a scalar value. It's, it's simply a number. Um, but the, the material uh, structure or, or chemistry, or I guess structure in any one of these uh, ways that I mean, um, that is high dimensional, right? It's like the collection of all of the different atoms in the system, um, or at least in a unit cell, and their like position in space and their chemistry. Um, that's a very complicated thing. Um, and so you can't simply, or I guess one uh, modulus doesn't correspond to one uh, <laughs> structure, 
there are a lot of ways you can arrange the atoms and get that modulus. So it's extremely challenging to go backwards. Um, some new approaches have become you know, popular in the last decades. Um, so something that can be done is basically data-driven inversion, data-driven modeling, um, where we try to basically interpolate between observations and find perhaps structures that have a, a very particular value of, a, of the modulus that we're interested in. Um, so we can do this by making basically regression models or using unsupervised methods like manifold learning to try to understand how different, um, different structures are related to each other and then do some kind of interpolation in space. Um, and so I wrote here kind of a way to write that down is like, we're, we're not really inverting the property back to a structure. We're more like looking in between known structures and finding precisely the value that we want. Um, more recently, there's been some really exciting work on generative modeling, which actually seeks to find sort of new candidates, new structures, um, rather than just looking at uh, interpolating in a space that we already know. Um, and there are some different ways of doing this, but this is really more uh, the spirit of this inverse evaluation, creating a function that actually inverts that scalar value back to maybe an entire ensemble of structures. Um, you know, there's not a single structure that gives you that, but um, being able to query this function and, and retrieve that ensemble of structures that matches your description opens up like an entirely new mode of design. Um, and as a kind of motivating example, I took Dr. Liu's slides basically from uh, our last meeting, and he had the content that was in this box here talking about CalFab, and he wrote that, you know, from derivatives of free energy, we, we can get, you know, thermochemical data, heat capacity, enthalpy, entropy, et cetera, and, you know, we can use phase stability and evaluate Gibbs energy of phases, and this lets us do materials design. Um, we can design equilibrium and driving force and chemical and physical properties, which he showed us, um, you know, tables of all of these uh, cross derivatives, where there's all these interesting properties that we could uh, design for. And, uh, you know, he told us about how mature CalFAT is, uh, and how we can do very sophisticated things looking at ternary and you know, multi-component systems. And um, there's all sorts of great things we can do for materials design, which is all true. Um, but what I, wanna, what I wanna add to it is this discussion of how do you do that design? And you know, there's an implied kind of arrow here that goes back to changing material composition or changing material processing or something. Um, there's some, when, when we say design, right, uh, we have to use our intuition to basically interpret uh, data that's coming out from CalFab. We may get very specific um, data, very informative data from, from the model, but then typically we have to make decisions based on that data um, in order to, you know, update this. Uh, composition and find something that does what we want. And so this is typically called like rational design, um, using human intuition to change the input variables such that we drive the system towards the performance or the uh, properties that we want. Um, and the question is, can we do better than rational design? And by better, I mean, perhaps a faster uh, amount of time, like in terms of a calculation, perhaps fewer iterations um, or reduced complexity, um, perhaps fewer uh, human time or human effort and more computer time. Um, and then of course, can we make the materials perform better? Can we get closer to the targets that we set for ourselves? Um, and one comment before I spend the whole rest of this talk talking about machine learning is I do want to say there's room for rational design and it, it belongs in uh, science. So basically, if this is a, if the y-axis is like the performance of your system and the x-axis is time or effort, basically, 
uh, rational design can get you to a fairly good design very quickly because as you know expert scientists we kind of we kind of know what things perform better than others we have a long history of of training and working with these systems so we may be able to guess almost immediately something that performs well um, but the more time you spend on the problem you may not see significant gains um, it may be that you kind of exhaust your intuition right away. Um, and then on the other hand, machine learning oftentimes give you basically nothing uh, for a long time. There's a very significant uh, investment required in acquiring training data and training the model. And because it doesn't know all of the things that you know, uh, it basically starts from scratch and has to learn all of the uh, obvious design rules. Um, but then at some point, once it, once it catches up to you, um, the ceiling is higher. So basically um, machine learning is capable of handling much more sophisticated relationships between data. Um, and it may be able to find new and uh, unexpected things uh, that you would never have found by just doing this rational design loop. And of course it can do iterations faster as well. Um, so I want to just kind of walk through some increasing complexity here with uh, design of experiments and using machine learning models basically um, to do science. And so uh, with adaptive design of experiments, like the conventional way to do this is you plan out um, what experiments you're going to do and you kind of you kind of space out your data points in a way where you think you'll uh, observe most of the relevant conditions, right? And then you take measurements and you might build an empirical model afterwards from the data. So you might do curve fitting or something more sophisticated, but basically you, you plan the experiment, you do the experiment, and then you do it offline model fitting. Um, one step towards this automated process is adaptive design of experiments where, uh, you know, measurements are planned and performed in batches. And so we can do an experiment, we can fit a model, make predictions, and then we can do a feedback loop, right? So this is some, some balance between the rational design and data-driven design where perhaps we have a good guess for where to start, but we have some uncertainty um, associated with that. And so we can make a model that tells us where to look next. And then we can do another experiment and maybe now we're within 10% and we can keep taking those uh, iterations until we succeed at finding whatever we're looking for. Um, so this is like online uh, use of predictive models. And so one kind of formalized way of doing this is Bayesian optimization. And so in Bayesian optimization, there's um, some unknown function. So this black line is the function. Um, and we basically fit this function with some uh, Gaussian uh, distribution and uh, the blue is uncertainty. And so basically in this example, we've already taken two measurements uh, where the black uh, dots are. And we, we kind of model both the value that we're observing and how confident we are in the value. So the places that we haven't um, observed yet have large uncertainty. And we can write down some formal definition of where we should look next. So basically, we, we want to look somewhere where um, not only is the value high, like in this case, we're trying to maximize this function, but we also want to look in places where we're not certain about the value. And so a simple, um, a simple acquisition function is just the maximum or the upper confidence bound, I guess it's called. So basically the place where this top blue line is maximized. So you can see on either side of this function, there's like a place where the maximum possible value based on our model is high. And so the next observation is not right in this uh, local maximum, but it's somewhere else that we, we can look to um, basically address this uncertainty. 
And as you continue sampling, you reduce that uncertainty and you kind of develop a good map of uh, where the function might be maximized. I have a GIF here, but it's not playing. So I'll just continue. Oh, there it is. So here's like an example. If you have a two-dimensional space, um, this is the target function. And there's an automatic procedure for sort of drawing samples such that you find where this function is the most red, um, but you also avoid uh, basically ignoring other places that might be, um, that might have a good value of that function. Um, so this is a very well-developed procedure and pretty well-known process, but I just wanted to mention it um, to motivate some of the other things that I'm gonna talk about. So, um, basically, if you would use that process of uh, kind of sampling in the space in batches and reevaluating uh, what's called a surrogate model that gives you an estimate of that function, um, you could, you know, for instance, design uh, a light emitting diode. Um, and in this case, uh, this is a paper from 2016, so it's a little bit old now. Um, but basically, they used that procedure, this Bayesian optimization procedure with Gaussian process modeling um, to try to discover like the optimal uh, structure for this LED. And in this chart, you can see basically the efficiency of the best LED versus like the iteration. And this, this is a very common shape for these charts where basically um, the model pretty quickly learns uh, which one, which uh, structures are good and which ones are bad. Um, and it's able to find something that has decent performance uh, within let's say like a hundred iterations. But then if you keep running this out to like a thousand iterations, it doesn't really improve, right? So after like, after a hundred or so iterations, it's basically stuck. Um, and the only thing that happens as you continue sampling like longer and longer is the, the model gets better at predicting the things that it's already seen. So this plot is basically, all the points should lie on a straight line if, um, if the model is performing well. And so when at first the model is performing moderately well, there's some scatter. After a thousand iterations, we've basically seen everything there is to see uh, in the space that we're sampling. And we basically converge the points onto this straight line. And so the problem is the model has basically explored the easily accessible space. Um, and it's quite confident in the values that it will see in that space. Um, but it's basically stuck. Um, at one kind of best solution. And so this leaves um, kind of a, a challenge of like, how do you get out of those? How do you do better than just sampling the things that you've seen? I kind of mentioned that before, like uh, interpolation versus generating truly new uh, examples. And then another challenge um, that comes up a lot is handling high dimensional spaces. And so in the example that I showed you with just like a two-dimensional function or a one-dimensional function, um, it's fairly straightforward or fairly obvious how you might uh, move around in that space and how you might do experiments to try to cover that space. Um, but if we wanna design, let's say a zeolite or a MOF, um, there are so many degrees of freedom in this system, like we can control uh, the composition, we can control, um, you know, the chemistry of like linkers in the MOS, um, and we can control, um, you know, processing conditions. So we have thousands of degrees of freedom here, which is typical of material synthesis problems. Um, and especially if these things interact with each other, uh, navigating these high dimensional spaces can be basically impossible. Um, so as an example, maybe you have time dependent synthesis conditions. And um, if I have, let's say a hundred points in time and I have temperature, pressure, composition, perhaps a field, um, electric field or something, 
how do I decide how to change each of these variables? And if I, if I try to do this um, surrogate modeling process that I just showed you um, with not two axes, but let's say like thousands of axes, uh, suddenly this becomes you know, incredibly challenging and, and very difficult to think about with human intuition. Um, so one answer to that problem is generative modeling or deep, special, especially deep generative modeling. Um, and I'm gonna show you some examples from this book um, by David Foster, which I really like as an introduction for uh, deep generative modeling. Um, and it's really great. It has hands-on practice exercises in Jupyter Notebooks, which are excellent. Um, and it was recently published in 2019, but it's already aging. Uh, machine learning moves really quickly right now. Um, so basically the introduction that he gives to generative modeling in that textbook is um, say we have this observed distribution in two dimensions and we have you know these samples. Uh, the question is, um, what is the underlying distribution of this data? So what are the rules that were used to generate these points? Is it uniform? Is it, you know, non-uniform? Um, does, it, does it fall in these boxes? Like this is a simple model. The orange points are a simple model for um, where these points are drawn from, right? Like it's probably not uniform, but maybe it's uniform within some smaller domain. And uh, if you look at the, you know, the gray in the background, like the true underlying distribution is a, a world map. Um, writing down a formula for a world map involves quite a lot of data. I mean, you have to basically define the boundaries of all of these um, little, you know, islands and, and coastal regions. Um, it's going to be a lot more complicated than just uh, a simple box or a few boxes. And so the question is, um, how can we come up with a model that approximates uh, the shape of the world map um, to a degree where we can't tell the difference? Um, and so he writes, like, we're impressed by a model. If it can generate examples that appear to have been drawn from that data distribution, and it can also generate examples that are suitably different from the observations. So for instance, um, if we had a model that can generate, you know, points from uh, Antarctica, which is, are missing down here in the bottom left, um, that would be impressive. Um, but just sampling, you know, more, basically, I guess, more, more points from Europe or Africa wouldn't be impressive because we already know there's data there. And again, this goes back to what I talked about before, the idea of interpolating in a known space versus uh, actually detecting and understanding the underlying distribution and sampling from that distribution without simply um, sampling around points that we already know. Um, and so hopefully you can see the analogy here of how this can be uh, extremely powerful if it's done correctly for materials. Um, I also wanted to show some really impressive examples from computer vision with generative modeling um, that is, are, is an example that's given in that textbook. Um, so this is, these are pictures of human faces that are generated by uh, generative models, basically between 2014 and, and 2020. And you can see that um, in 2014, they, they looked like really old, grainy, like black and white photos. 2015, 2016, they started to look like kind of like people, but really creepy and clearly digitally generated or altered. Um, in 2017 and 2018, we really started to make progress with this problem. And now um, as of you know, 2020, you can go to this website, thispersondoesnotexist.com. And if someone showed you one of these pictures, you probably wouldn't be able to tell that it's not real other than some weird kind of artifacts sometimes in the background. But these are very you know, convincing examples of human faces in high resolution um, of people that don't exist. And what's more is that not only do these, are these images able to be generated that are realistic looking, but you can actually use these models to generate specific uh, examples of people. So I might say like, I want a child, 
or I want like a middle-aged man or something. And the computer knows what that means and it can generate you examples. So again, I hope you can see the analogy here, how these models could be extremely powerful for us to design uh, new materials, which may have thousands of degrees of freedom. I mean, here we're looking at an image that has, uh, I think maybe like a million pixels in it. Um, and each pixel can take a continuous range of color values. Uh, this is millions of degrees of freedom. Um, and yet somehow the computer has learned what, what a picture of a human face means and it can generate uh, notably different examples. Um, and so the way that it does this is basically by using uh, latent spaces to do data abstraction. Um, and so a latent space is a low dimensional representation of a high dimensional data set. And so a simple example is this, uh, what's called the Swiss roll, um, where you have a three dimensional, uh, a two dimensional manifold that's basically projected in three dimensional space. And so if you look at this as a, you know, a human expert on 3D geometry, you say, oh yeah, clearly like there's two meaningful dimensions here. Um, and yet these coordinates lie in a three dimensional space. And so kind of unrolling that manifold is a simple example of um, dimensionality reduction or the formation of a of latent space. That's a more meaningful representation. And as another example, um, here's a kind of a schematic of different sized cylinders. And if I tell you that this latent space for cylinders has two meaningful dimensions like radius and height, um, you say, well, of course, like these are just cylinders. They don't have very many degrees of freedom, but it's an image of a cylinder that's represented by pixels. And so somehow there's an underlying rule, an underlying set of rules that determine what the cylinder and how the arrangement of pixels relate to two key parameters, radius and height. So this is the kind of idea that we want to use to represent materials um, in a low dimensional way that we can understand, but also kind of engineer and then uh, project back up to the full high dimensional problem. Um, and so I'm not going to get into too many details here, but I did want to mention the basic ideas about neural networks. Um, so neural networks basically use two key transformations to approximate functions. Um, they use linear transforms and nonlinear activation. And the importance of the combination of this is that uh, with linear transforms and nonlinear activations, we can approximate any function. So we basically take some input as like a vector and we do something to them uh, and then we get a value out. And this, this doing something part has both a linear and a nonlinear part, which means that we can use this uh, recipe to approximate any function. And this is really important because what we want to do with this generative modeling idea is approximate distributions that are quite complex. And so while a single, uh, what's called a single layer of the neural network can only do this to some limited extent, um, deep neural networks can do this um, with perhaps millions or billions of parameters and learn extremely complicated functions. And the reason that deep neural networks are so popular right now is because basically the linear transforms are fast um, and the nonlinear activations introduce complexity in a reliable way. And so even though those, that one layer is fairly simple, if you combine this into many layers, maybe uh, tens or hundreds of layers, and you do all sorts of uh, very fancy tricks uh, with linear algebra, um, we can literally learn any functional mapping, which means we can learn uh, in a very general way these extremely um, non-trivial probability distributions uh, of these high dimensional spaces, which uh, describe um, how material composition influences its properties, for instance. Um, and I say here, even better, it works. Um, you know, this has been proven on all sorts of uh, data sets, especially in computer vision. And so we can kind of take heart that this will work because people have shown that it works for other types of very complicated data. Um, 
And so now I'm going to actually talk about generative models just in a few slides here. So one uh, simple generative model is called an autoencoder. And basically, autoencoders learn re reversible mappings from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional space and then back. And so here we have some input data. And in this case, it's an image. So again, images are pretty high dimensional. Um, they have pixels, like many hundreds of pixels and uh, values on each of the pixels. And then uh, a neural network called an encoder uh, basically takes this high dimensional data and smashes it down into a couple of numbers. That's called the, the latent space or the latent vector. And then these couple of numbers get basically uncompressed by an, a, another neural network called a decoder um, that tries to approximate that original data. And so these two uh, neural networks are trained together such that the encoder learns the optimal mapping from high dimensional data to low dimensional data. And likewise, the decoder learns the optimal uh, transformation from that low dimensional vector back to a faithful reproduction of that original high dimensional data. And so essentially what this is doing is it's learning um, the optimal latent space, the optimal low dimensional space to capture all the relevant information. And so this basically serves as a uh, general framework to learn abstractions. And so this is an example of a latent space on handwritten digits, um, where basically you have a continuous interpolation between uh, digits one, zero through nine. And it's very interesting to look at because you can see that you go smoothly from like a seven to a one, from a one to a five, uh, from seven, nine, eight. I mean, you can see when you look at this, how, um, the position basically in this latent space is encoding something meaningful about the, the curvature or the, you know, the shape of numbers of handwritten digits. And so this is basically learned um, a, a distribution of the way that pixels should be arranged in handwritten digits. And so this, this concept ports actually really easily to material science uh, through an analogy with MGI. Um, so, you know, material genome initiatives encourage us, us to form quantitative understandings of uh, structure property relationships. And uh, likewise, generative models are built on this idea of latent space manipulation. And so that latent space can be thought of as a genome where you basically have some high dimensional data might be in this case, it's you know just uh, molecular structure um, that goes into this neural network, and then we have in between the encoder and the decoder this this latent vector, which is essentially like the genome. It's it's encoding the most relevant information about that material, and then the decoder gives us a way to basically take the genome and produce samples from it. And the beauty of the sort of stochastic nature of these generative models is just like with real evolution, we have some adherence to the genes, but also some essentially random mutations. And so it gives us both uh, large scale trends over the genome, over variations in the genome, I should say, uh, but also novelty and the ability to explore like new and un um, unseen kind of examples. Um, and so an example of, uh, or a couple examples I should say of latent spaces being used in recent materials literature are uh, alloy design, um, prediction of stable crystal structures for new alloy compositions, and also um, you know, porous materials. So in this case, um, this is a latent space map of, I believe it was aluminum alloys. And the idea here is uh, you, you can write down all of these aluminum alloys that have been studied, and then you can do this autoencoder mapping, compressing these things down into, uh, let's say, two dimensions. And then you, know, you also train this decoder that 
is able to take those that low dimensional representation back to the, the full recipe that you need to make the alloy. But then in this low dimensional space, you get groupings um, of basically compositions and you can do things like interpolate between groups. You can um, find like exemplars from groups. Uh, so this is a very interesting way of uh, trying to sample new compositions. Um, you can also do things like interpolate in the space. So I showed that with the handwritten digits, but you can also do it with like these uh, metallo organic frameworks. So you can actually say what's halfway in between like two different MOFs and you can find a new uh, MOF chemistry that perhaps has exactly halfway in between uh, those properties. Um, finally, I'll just mention kind of the state of the art for generative modeling, which is called generative adversarial networks. These have really revolutionized the field of generative modeling. Um, and the idea is you provide real data and then you train two different neural networks together, kind of like with the autoencoder, um, but it's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, the idea is one of the neural networks tries to learn uh, the difference between real data and fake data or data that doesn't basically adhere to the rules that you've given it in the training set. The other one takes random noise and tries to learn how to trick the discriminator. And so basically the generator neural network is learning how to map randomness into realistic images. And the discriminator is trying to learn how to, how to um, determine what's real and what's fake. And because these both basically compete, um, they both get better and they both get better very fast actually. And so here's an example of, again, handwritten digits because computer scientists love this problem. Um, at the beginning, the generator is terrible and it can just generate basically random noise. As it goes on, structure emerges and it gets better and better at tricking the discriminator. And the idea is that it can then trick you, essentially. It becomes, it becomes real in a sense. Um, these have been used recently for crystal structure prediction uh, and you can also use some um, extension of GANs called conditional GANs, where basically not only does it learn how to map the randomness into realistic samples, but it also learns how to include composition constraints um, on that mapping. And so essentially this thing can learn, given a composition, generate an ensemble of crystal structures that are plausible. And this is exactly the kind of approach that we're going to uh, be pursuing like the use of this generative model with a conditional uh, constraint. Um, I think this is my last slide. So basically, um, I wanted to just show a really exciting uh, example of the types of things you can do with GANs. Um, and perhaps we're not there yet in materials science, but uh, the computer scientists certainly are. This is called style GAN. And on the, um, on the left here, you can see example images where they're trying to take uh, style, like in a very abstract sense, and apply it to another image. So in this case, you have this guy with sunglasses on, and the algorithm says, how do I make this guy with sunglasses look like uh, this image? And it learns how to like map these very high level features from one image onto another image. And so you can see these examples of how it really like works for your human intuition or your human sense of, of style or of like what, what are the abstract concepts that are uh, conveyed by a collection of pixels. And so hopefully this shows you the complexity of functions that can be learned by these, these deep neural networks and especially by this adversarial training scheme. Um, and then I just wanted to have one final comment on data representation. So uh, I showed you a lot of examples of GANs with uh, images and um, you know that's just kind of the way that it grew up out of the computer vision field. Um, but this is becoming more commonplace, I would say, in materials and chemistry. And we have a lot of options with data representation. And so here you see this molecule that can be represented in 
uh, one of eight different ways. And of course, there's even more ways than that. Um, but basically, we shouldn't be afraid of using uh, developments from computer science uh, just because they work on human faces and not on, you know, molecules. Like there are ways we can deal with that. And so we should be flexible with data formats um, and we should take advantage of essentially the latest and greatest that we can find. That's it.